So we are here to remember Professor Rudolf Alswede, who suffered a heart attack on, in the early morning hours of December 18, just six weeks before this conference. And I, my name is Ulrich Tamm. I was his assistant, assistant at his chair for about 10 years during the 1990s. And in the name of his research group, Still, uh, still in Bielefeld, I uh, thank, to, uh, thank the organizers for making this uh, memorial possible. So we, I mentioned already we are, have a tight schedule. The buses are waiting. I will briefly present a retrospective on his life and work. And then we have a list of 13 speakers now. And I like them to, to keep the three minutes for their presentation. Okay. In this uh, retrospective, I follow the obituary we prepared with Imre Chisa, Ning Chai, and Kingo Kobayashi for the IT Society newsletter. I tried to keep it brief and also uh, wrote down some uh, keywords. But this is not in the obituary in the early years. He was a gymnast. He was very active. He's the small boy here on the right. And he was very good in this. He was a regional champion in one of the German lands, uh, gymnastics. His scientific career started at the University of Göttingen, where he studied mathematics and in 1966 obtained his uh, doctoral degree. Uh, and his advisor was Konrad Jacobs, who started information theory in Germany. He then moved to the United States made his way from assistant professor to full professor at Ohio State University in Columbus. And in this time, followed a lot of his famous results, his joint papers with Wolfowitz, <coughs> coding theory for the MAC, and some contrib more contributions to multi-user information theory. Imro mentioned that a lot of his ideas found entrance into the Chisa Körner book. Then he returned to Germany. In 1975, he accepted an offer from the University of Bielefeld. There he found uh, very good research conditions, in the beginning at least. From the scientific point of view, he left information theory for a while and uh, did work in combinatorics, number theory, and computer science, the shape of his research profile for the following years with information theory, of course. And he also had famous results there, the Altswede Deakin inequality even bears his name. And in computer science, he has this famous classic book with uh, Ingo Wegener. Of course, he did not leave information theory forever, and his results were very good. He received the uh, IT Society Best Paper Award twice in 1988 and shortly after in 1990, first with Imre Chisar and then with Gunther Dück. Here's a journal, uh, newspaper article on the occasion of his first award. In Bielefeld, he built up the applied mathematics and in the end of the 1980s, 1989 to 2000, they had a, the department had a very big research project for 12 years. Alone at his chair, he had three additional positions and a lot of funds for guests. Many people in the audience have been in Bielefeld in these years. And there's an article from, from, from the newspaper on the occasion of the opening of this research project where he is uh, among his colleagues. So he had three additional positions and he could hire researchers for a longer period. Famous names now, Zhen Zhang will, is here and will present a lecture about his results. Ning Chai was on one of these positions and Levon Kachatrian. One of the highlights was this 500, the solution of the $500 problem with Paul Erdős, 
here's uh, the picture when Paul Edeshit uh, paid the amount. We had many international guests in, this, uh, in those years, and also a lot of PhD students. Let us just mention Andreas Winter, because with him he opened, uh, and, uh, he uh, again started a new field, uh, namely quantum information theory, very successfully. Then, after this big research project was closed, he managed to find an even more prestigious research project, an interdisciplinary research project. He was working on a general theory of information transfer, combining the uh, information transmission and theory of identification, which do not imply each other. Then he retired in 2003, and after his retirement, which is very unusual in Germany, he had several further research projects, uh, which even were extended until today. Especially this uh, Center of Interdisciplinary Research, CIF in German, gave him opportunities to organize a lot of conferences. He received a lot of honors. He was Shannon Lecturer in 2006. He won the uh, Best Paper Award twice. I mentioned already he had a honorary <coughs> doctor degree from the Russian Academy of Sciences, and so on. So this picture was taken in the beginning of December. So it's probably the last picture of him. And does not look as, he does not look as if he would not be among us only two weeks later. So he was still very active, had a lot of research projects, two in Bielefeld, another one he started with Holger Boche from Munich in, on quantum information. A pro visiting prof professorship was planned and the apartment already rented, and uh, also his uh, his book project, four volume books, thousand pages each on information theory, uh, is unfinished. Hopefully they will publish it posthumously because they have the okay for the first three volumes already. Let me conclude with some pictures of his 60th birthday, which show him among his family and his friends. On the picture on the lower left side, he's with his former wife Beatrix and with his advisor Konrad Jacobs. On the right side behind him is his son Alexander. And in front, Walter Deuber, the combinatorics professor from Bielefeld. And the other ones you know, Jim Messi and Jack van Nint, his co-organizers of the Oberwolfach workshops, Mark Pinsker and Andras Schakusi, whom he was very proud of, uh, attracting uh, this famous number theorist as his uh, co-author. Okay, so let me conclude now. And I also ask the following speakers to keep the three minutes, at least on average. <laughs> then we can finish before the buses leave. So I will not return and announce any, everybody here. So here's the list. Professor Shamai will not uh, speak. I forgot to skip him. Then Sergius should speak after Robert Calderbeck. And just keep an eye on them. Well, Rudy Alsweda was a great friend of mine. We met uh, in Tsakajor uh, in Armenia in uh, 1969, and we became fast friends spending hours on the bus trips connected with that meeting, talking to each other as fast as we could about the various things we were working on. In fact, there's no friend like the first friends you make in this technical area because you don't have any results to divide you. <laughs> so, uh, but we were very interested in each other's problems and he was a kindred spirit. And, uh, I would like to say, though, that he was a uh, good listener and, of course, a, a good speaker. He's a very cheerful, positive person. 
And I'd like to draw your attention to two pictures that you have here. And in the lower right-hand corner of this uh, remembrance is a picture of a cheerful Rudy Alsueda, the way he looks when he's telling you his results. And in the upper left-hand corner is how he looks when he's listening to your results. So let me conclude with a story. We invited him to Stanford for six months in 1981. And he came, and uh, he'd been there about three months. And I got a call from him around three in the morning. And he said, Tom, uh, uh, something terrible has happened to my house, which he'd left empty back in Bielefeld. He says, apparently the pipes burst, and they flooded the entire house and turned into ice, and the ice burst open the windows and burst open the front door and it formed an ice waterfall down the stairs and so on. I said, well, are you going to go back? And he says, I don't think I need to do anything about that. But let me tell you about a recent result I just got. <laughs> Uh, uh, Rudy is the, my longtime friend, and we also have a long-term collaboration for uh, uh, through this telephone. I have to turn off this. We have a very long-term uh, collaboration for over 25 years. I first time met uh, Rudy, uh, uh, Toby invited Rudy to uh, Cornell. I was a PhD student there. And then uh, at that time, I was working on the multiple distribution source coding. And then uh, we proved uh, L gamma cover theorem tied in the binary case, in the no access read uh, case for binary source. And then I told uh, Rudy, and our conjecture, they should be tied in general in the no accessory case. And then we turn to uh, attention to the, uh, prove the L gamma cover theorem is not tied in general. And then after uh, only a, a couple of months, I learned that the Rudy solved the problem. So that's the one of the reason I decided to uh, want to uh, work with Rudy for a while. It's really powerful. Yeah. And I got to uh, Bielefeld in uh, 1986, and then I learned Rudy has not made tremendous, remarkable contributions in information theory, but also in combinatorics. Yeah, he asked me to work on the uh, combinatorial trimble theory. I read the, his work with the Dinkin, the Ashwi Dinkin inequality. It's really an amazing result. And then we, I worked with uh, Rudy for two years work on many problems uh, I really uh, benefit from his uh, sharp mind. I remember uh, I solved some problem. I read some problem, I solved problem. And that's called the uh, creating order uh, uh, via finite state machine. And then the, I wrote uh, two proofs. I gave it to uh, Rudy. After a couple of days, give me a big chart. Here's for the input, give the, this many constraints. Yeah, give the processor this many constraints, and this uh, this many possible uh, memory constraints. Give the lots of things and draw a chart, and then all the the intersection of those <laughs> items is one problem. Actually, uh, this uh, that's the real uh, problem of uh, creating orders. Yeah, and. I know that uh, many people have worked on <laughs> those problems that's uh, from this chart. And uh, I left the uh, Bielefeld in 88, and then I revisited Bielefeld twice. Every time I visited uh, Rudy, he told me something new. Yeah. Once I was there, he told me he used the combinatorial method 
very famous math pushing method to number theory. Yeah, it creates a very beautiful result. The next time uh, we know the identification already, next time I visit him, he told me he's working on information transfer. Very uh, general uh, framework, yeah. So it's a big loss to us, yeah. Rudy uh, passed away. It's a big loss to information, both information theory, also community networks. Yeah, so most recently, uh, he made contributions to a network coding area we are still working uh, working in, yeah. So we lost a very good friend. Uh, Rudy Aswida, I, he was one of a handful of giants in our field, and he was a large and colorful presence in our community. It's very hard to believe that we won't see him anymore. Uh, those of us who knew Rudy uh, know, he, know that he could be very quirky, and he could be very large-hearted as well. So I thought I'd tell you two stories illustrating each. Uh, the quirkiness. Uh, it was in the late 80s or the early 90s he submitted a paper for review which, which to the IT transactions which came to me for review. And of course, in Rudy's typical style, he had forgotten to write the abstract. There was no abstract in the submission. So for the, I reviewed the paper and, and for the sake of the associate editor, I thought I'd summarize what the contributions were. And I sent the review back. I said the author is, is requested to kindly put an abstract and rewrite portions of the paper. So Rudy modified the paper, sent it back, and now it had an abstract. So when I look at, looked at the abstract, it, it, it rang a bell. And it turns out that um, he, this were, these were his generous comments. He said, it seems that the referee has managed to understand our results and has summarized, summarized them well. So we shall use his summary as an abstract. <laughs> and. Uh, a few weeks later, I ran into him, and uh, he was talking about this result. We discussed it. I kept a straight face. And his parting shot was, I know either you or Imre Chisa reviewed that paper. <laughs> there was another story which illustrates another side of, uh, there's another story which illustrates another side of Rudy. Um, I had a student in the, in, the, in the 80s who worked on a problem that uh, Rudy had worked on. Uh, uh, the student and I formulated the problem, and uh, we did some initial calculations, and I left on a sabbatical trip. I came back two months later, and the student had made some progress on this problem, and we resumed our work together on it, but uh, we couldn't make any further headway on the problem. It was a difficult problem, and the only progress that was made, the significant progress, was what the student had done. So we thought, since nothing more could be done, at least we didn't have the means to do it, uh, the paper was submitted, and uh, since the student had done most of the work, it was submitted as a sole authored paper. The paper went for review, came back a few months later. There were four reviews. The first review was the usual cursory one, uh, which said that this paper makes a very big contribution to this field, which was rubbish because it was a very modest contribution. There were two other reviews which were more tempered. They said the paper should be accepted, uh, but with certain modifications. The fourth review, we could see just by the language and the style that it was by Rudy, the one and only. That review was scathing. Uh, it began by saying that uh, this is a very difficult problem. Anybody who chooses to work on such a problem should have such and such background, uh, should have such and such ability. The student was very worried when he read that. I said, don't worry about it. After all, you and I are mere mortals. Uh, then the review said that this is really very preliminary work. Uh, it's a difficult problem, but it's not enough. Uh, the authors could have done more. I agreed with that part. The next part said that uh, the authors have not read these papers by R. Alswida, <laughs> where hints are given as to how this problem could be solved. And that I found disputable because I had read those papers, as had the student. <laughs> And I thought uh, by then Rudy had laid the groundwork for a rejection of the paper. And then came the final paragraph. It said, and I still remember those words, it said, had this paper been written by a more seasoned researcher, I would have, re I would have rejected it. 
But it is clear that the author is a young person. He's, he's new to the field of information theory. And it's important for us to, to encourage such people and to nurture them. And therefore, I will recommend publication if the author is to do this and this and this. We made the changes and the paper appeared. And that's how I'll always remember Rudy as, as, a, as a great scientist and as, as a magnanimous person. Thank you. So I'd like to say uh, a few words of appreciation for Rudy's work with uh, Levon Kachatrian um, on the uh, complete intersection theorem for systems of finite sets. And I'd like to think that I played a small role in um, piquing his interest in this problem. So in 1938, Erdős asked this question, how many two a 2m elements of a 4m set could you have with the property that any two of them would have to intersect in two points? And um, this problem had caught my attention, and I'd worked on it with Peter Frankel, and we had used some very complicated algebra from Delsart to get some bounds that agreed with what Edish knew to be the truth. And what Edish knew to be the truth was the way that you should construct the extremal example was to pick two M elements of the 4M set and insist that every set in your collection met the first half in M plus one points. Now, I remember uh, Rudy looking like that picture in the top left-hand corner when I explained to him what I had done with Peter Frankel. And um, sure enough, just a few years later, there was this beautiful paper with Kachatrian where not only did he get the, the right order of magnitude, but he actually nailed all of the extremal examples. And so I was, and still am, profoundly impressed by this combinatorial power. So uh, I uh, met Rudy at one of the uh, Swedish uh, Soviet uh, workshops that used to take place every two years. And the last time I saw him was actually in September in Dublin. Uh, he was already walking with some difficulty, but he was, he was in good spirits. Um, already in one of those Swedish uh, workshops, um, you know, I spent quite a bit of time with him uh, discussing problems. And this man was, uh, science was everything for him. Uh, he would never go to uh, an excursion, the typical ISIT excursion or anything like that. He would stay up uh, late uh, talking uh, with uh, colleagues about problems and so on. He would go to every uh, recent result session and so on. Really uh, a remarkable um, example. I always like to uh, uh, meet with him towards the beginning of the conference because Rudy had um, a one shared policy in conferences, if you know what I mean. Uh, uh, so let me uh, let me see if I uh, I can share with you some anecdotes. Well, um, many of you probably were at his uh, Shannon lecture in 2006. Um, in Seattle, and um, he, I don't remember that he actually make, made any jokes that um, on purpose, but at some point, you know, he always would, would write his slides on foils and so on, and for the first time I, I had seen him, this was a prepared presentation uh, on, you know, with, um, with a computer, and at some point it didn't work, it, it uh, you know, it the, the slide wouldn't go further, and he started like, it doesn't work, I don't know what's going on. And then he says, oh, no, it's, it's finished. The lecture is finished. 
So that was, that was fun. Another time, uh, I remember we were in uh, Salvador de Bahia uh, in an IT workshop in 92. And, um, and he, uh, he had this conjecture about something uh, which sounded very difficult to prove. But, you know, he was kind of like very sure, uh, very self-assured, and he says, well, um, I tell you what, um, the final of the European Cup is uh, between Denmark and Germany on Sunday. And of course, Germany at that time was heavily favored to win, uh, to win that uh, final. And, um, and then he said, is, if Denmark uh, wins, then uh, I will prove this result. <laughs> and then a year later, uh, I met him and said, uh, Rudy, Denmark won. Uh, where's the proof? No, he says, no, 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 no. I said, if Germany wins, I would prove the result. So, um, you know, he had, he, he was, uh, you know, he, he could be very charming. He could also be very non-charming. Um, but I, I do remember once um, uh, Tesun Han and I were working on uh, trying to understand his problem on identification via channels. Um, they had a converse proof that we never uh, succeeded in understanding. And uh, so we came up with our own, uh, which um, was using a different route. And when we finally um, uh, finished the proof, then uh, Tesun Han, in his inimitable style, says, now Rudy is naked. <laughs> so when I presented the result at, at uh, one of the ISITs, the, the, the proof, then uh, Rudy came to me after the talk and says, Sergio, now I believe the result. <laughs> Well, I, um, I was very fortunate uh, to know, uh, interact with Al Zueda when, as a graduate student and in the first few years of my career um, uh, at ISITs. Um, we invited him at Stanford, as Tom said, for six months. And uh, he invited me to spend a month in, uh, in Bielefeld. Um, and uh, I learned quite a bit from him, and I, you know, again, when you know somebody of that stature when you're young, it's way bigger than when you know them when you're older, you know. So he, to me, he's definitely one of the giants of, of our field. Um, I am, I have a, I'll sway the distance of one. Um, so my student, he and my student, King Pang, and I wrote a paper called The Two-Family Extremal Problem in Hamming Space which was motivated by finding the communication complexity of computing the Hamming distance. And that was quite an experience, I have to tell you. Um, so I have a few anecdotes about Alzueta that I'd like to share with you. So the first one uh, was during writing this paper. Um, those of you that worked with him know that he has a temper, right, to say the least. Um, so, so in one of the many heated discussions about um, uh, during the working on this paper, he shouted, you are just like Janusz Kerner. And today, I still don't know whether that was an insult or a, <laughs> a compliment. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't ask him anymore. Um, on another story, after I finished my visit to Bielefeld, um, Rudy gave me a ride to Paris from Bielefeld uh, on his way to a vacation on, uh, in Spain. He used to go in August, like most Germans, they will migrate to Spain. And he was driving at this frighteningly fast speeds. I mean, I was on the Autobahn, I was just, and, and I'm not a slow driver myself, but so it was unbelievably fast. So the police stopped us. So I knew they stopped us because of the high speed, right? Um, uh, we're going to get a ticket and so on. But it turned out that that was not the reason. The reason why we were stopped is they were saying, the police, I think, were saying to themselves, um, what is this straw hat 
wearing pudgy guy doing with this skinny, dark, Middle Eastern looking guy. <laughs> so they asked us for our papers and uh, fortunately we had them. So The last story is kind of very recent actually and it happened after uh, Alzueda died. The day after he died, uh, one of my sons was uh, clearing his closet, if you can believe that. Um, and <laughs> he found some um, postcards and so he said, do you know where these are from? And I looked at them to my surprise, and so to prove to you, it turned out these are from Billefeld in 1981, in the summer. <laughs> so if you want to know what Billefeld looked like, in 1981 I have postcards. So I was actually quite saddened when I heard about the news of Alzuida's death, I was actually working on the chapter on interference channels, which as you know, he, he was the first person to introduce that problem. And um, so I was kind of uh, very, quite sad actually. Uh, but um, he will always remain as one of my heroes as a young um, graduate student and as faculty member. So if Abbas talked about how one is impressed when they meet Alswedes, a young professor, you can imagine how one is impressed when they meet Alswedes as a student of that young professor, because I was there at the time. And as everyone has already said, Rudy was one of the truly great information theorists. If you read this paper, you'll see that so many of them have new problems, new techniques, new results, new insights. And he was also one of the first to explore the close connection between information theory and combinatorics, which had continued to believe in and, and, and further uh, till he passed away. Um, so to check how much I appreciated Rudy's research, I thought I'd take advantage of my, um, this being my home, home turf. And um, you see, like back in the old times, there was an easy way to, to decide how much you liked someone's work. You just uh, went to a file cabinet, and you saw how many of the papers you actually read. So I went back to my office, and I looked at the file cabinet, and there was like a folder going from C to E, and then from F to H, and then from I to K, and so on. But when I looked at the A's, there was one folder that just said AH. And <laughs> In this folder, it's true, there's one paper by Al Ejo. <laughs> and of the remaining papers, I think one of the, those that I like the most is titled Coloring Hypergraph, a New Approach to Multi-User uh, Source Coding, which I actually know that uh, Aswad was very proud of. And um, when you look at it, it's not exactly San Diego Beach reading. Uh, but when you start here, it's, he actually says that he wanted to write an elaborate paper, but he decided to keep it short. <laughs> and um, and uh, I actually, in spite of the, the brevity of the paper, there, there are a lot of interesting results here and very useful results, and some of them I subsequently used. And Rudy himself actually used to joke that, uh, or not, that he thought that all results on combinatorial information theory were in this, in this paper, just that people didn't have the patience to find them. So I wish that um, Rudy stayed longer with us, and I wish that we had more patience to read more of this and his other papers. Thank you. Hey, the, the first time I met Rudy was at Oba Wolfar, and that's what I think about first when I talk about him. That was a conference that started back uh, to 1979, the first time. And there were like 45 participants, one third were coding theorists invited by Van Lint. I was in that category. And the uh, other third was cryptologist in invited by Massey, and the third group was information theory invited by Rudy. And this conference has a lot of influence in, uh, among European researchers, and that's uh, the conference that we were from Norway were first invited to the big uh, world at that time. And 
I remember uh, the first meeting seeing this uh, big German in the first row, and he had a lot of uh, intelligent and critical remarks. And uh, he made a very good, uh, strong impression. And I remember uh, that he was interested in many talks, and once I gave a talk in Oberwolfer, and I was very afraid of the talk because it was very technical, because I substitute, it was quadratic residue codes, and I substituted and I substituted, and I thought this would be too technical so everybody would be bored. And, but then I was very surprised because that talk, whatever sentence I said, I had a question from Rudy. So I think it was like having an exam. I think the question time was bigger than the lecture time. And I think this is typical Rudy, that sometimes he got interested in something. He had this research curiosity. And he was even on the wrong, he was information series, I was in coding series. The coding series should ask the questions, but Rudy did. And this was quite uh, typical of him. And it says a lot about him. I had never had a joint paper with Rudy, but I still uh, met him at conferences, and I could talk with him with oh, many different things. And I think it's a great loss for the community that, that he is not among us, but I am happy to have met Rudy. He gave a lot of impression, a great impression on me. Thank you. Most of us know Rudy as a great uh, information theorist. Uh, as focused as he was on his uh, specific uh, research and the problems that were interested and he was interested in. He also for me will stay, he always stay for me as a kind of renaissance man with a great uh, curiosity, ability to reach across different fields, funny character and ability to reach uh, to many people. Uh, I talked to him at many conferences and one of these conferences uh, really stands out for me. It was in Merle in 1993 when Rudy offered me a uh, ride back uh, to Germany, where I was with Humboldt Foundation at that time. So it was a long trip, but we immediately interrupted it in uh, Copenhagen, where Rudy decided to show Nin Chai and myself the city, and it was an amazing, absolutely amazing intellectual tour de force. He was guiding us across the narrow streets of Copenhagen and talking about the history of the city uh, with such a detail as if he was present there at the times of Hans Christian Andersen and even before. So it was really amazing. And on the way back then I learned that Rudy actually was uh, hesitating for quite some time before he started uh, doing mathematics. He studied uh, languages, he studied philosophy, and he t it took him some time uh, to decide in favor of mathematics instead of uh, philosophy. And uh, this uh, great uh, versatility also absolutely evident in uh, his research. He could easily switch, as many of us know, from information theory to periodic number theory to combinatorics, and he also had made uh, quite seminal contributions in uh, coding theory. Together with uh, Pinsker and Basaliga, he opened the problem, the whole field actually, of uh, uh, codes correcting localized errors, and a few years later, just in two, three years, the three of them actually closed the field. They constructed exact bounds, they constructed asymptotically optimal codes, and they even constructed the algorithms uh, with uh, polynomial uh, complexity. And this brings me to another really unique character of Rudy, his ability to reach uh, to many people. He had uh, many dozens of long-term visitors at Bielefeld, uh, not counting even short-term visitors, and uh, he really could uh, work with all the people, and if you just take the former Soviet Union alone, I can't think of any, almost everybody, I mean information theorists, uh, visited him at some time or the other. And uh, all four centers that uh, are present in the former Soviet Union, uh, Moscow, Institute for Problems of Information Transmission, Armenian Academy of Sciences, Novosibirsk University, many people from all, and uh, St. Petersburg University, so people from many uh, places uh, visited him quite a few times. And the last thing about his funny uh, character, 
Uh, he is well known for his really funny jokes and actually had a very great sense of humor and uh, could make uh, the, the things look uh, less stressful uh, even uh, when it was uh, really hard on some people. I remember the conference in Uzbekistan in Tashkent in 1984 where most of participants uh, got uh, uh, food poisoned and uh, uh, absolutely unaware of this, uh, they went for a long trip, all of us went on this long trip from Tashkent uh, to the ancient Samarkand. Upon arrival uh, to Samarkand, people were quite distressed and everybody was in great need of finding public facilities which were almost non-existent at that uh, time outside of Tashkent. It was kind of remote area and uh, there were no public facilities available. And uh, still the people laughed when Rudy said that there was no other conference with such an urgent call for papers. <laughs> <laughs> this is, people, it, it really made the things uh, look much less stressful. <laughs> Last time I met with him in uh, Dublin, and was the same kind of Renaissance man with a twinkle in the eye, uh, with uh, great uh, uh, excitement about his uh, new grant, uh, questioning people, answering questions, and I will always uh, uh, cherish this memory of a man who uh, could make life to be fun for himself and uh, for others. Thank you. I just uh, learned the other day about the passing of uh, Rudy, and it makes me very sad. But uh, I've known, I knew him for over 30 years. In fact, I met him when I was a student of Tom's at Stanford, and he came for his sabbatical or whatever it was, and he shared an office with uh, Max Costa and Dave Gluss and I. And he really was a very, uh, very interesting person, very kind. He, he had a, a rough side to him. He was always very challenging. Uh, I remember I was working on my thesis, and he was very interested in that. And uh, he was quite a big smoker then, but uh, he did go outside, so that was nice. Uh, I went to my first information theory symposium in that year, and he went there, and he did ask a lot of questions. I remember Abbas was a little bothered by that, but it didn't bother me at all because I was used to him by then. And uh, uh, he was a very generous person. Uh, he did. He was quite a go-getter, very curious. Uh, if you know me, I, work, I worked on a lot of different things, and so it didn't matter what I was working on. I could talk to him about it, and he'd have, he'd have interesting questions. It was incredible. Uh, he did invite me to the Oberwolfbach. I have a little story about uh, the Audubon I, I was going to close on. Um, I don't know if many people were there, but uh, he had invited me as for information theory, but I actually gave a talk on coding theory there. He again asked a lot of very penetrating questions in my talk, and I always I, I actually enjoyed that because it's, somebody was actually paying attention to what you were doing. Uh, at that conference, there was sort of a famous incident, which was uh, uh, Chizar had a uh, Soviet-made car that he drove to the conference, and it kept uh, conking out on him. And so he somehow had mentioned that to me, and. Uh, I come from uh, kind of humble beginnings. My grandfather had many careers, and one was auto repair, so I knew quite a lot about cars. So he told me his car kept dying whenever he went to an intersection. So I said, oh, I'll take a look at it. And uh, I played around with the carburetor. Basically, I think I just turned the idle up. But he, he was, they were all impressed, especially Rudy. And uh, every time Cheezer sees me, he asks me how my car repair business is doing. <laughs> After the conference, uh, I needed a ride to Frankfurt, and so Rudy offered uh, to take me, but because I had repaired the car, I guess, he said, well, why don't you drive? So <laughs> uh, we went on the Autobahn, and uh, uh, he encouraged me to drive very fast. He explained to me there was no speed limit. Uh, it was really quite an adventure. You, you had to watch out in the fast lane because uh, there were these guys in Porsches and things. He had a Volvo which would do pretty good, but was no match for some of the uh, speedsters. But uh, we went over to Frankfurt. He showed he knew all about Frankfurt. Uh, 
the red light district and all of that. It was really quite exciting. So uh, he was a really great guy. I always enjoyed meeting him at the meetings. He always had something interesting to say. He was always very supportive. So I, I'll miss him. Well, it, uh, it's clear that uh, Rudy Alsweather was a uh, was very interesting person and and fun, a lot of fun. Um, a few encounters uh, that I had with him. Actually, the, I first met him also in this uh, Swedish-Russian conference. Actually, it was my first workshop in information theory. It was in Gotland, '89, I believe. Uh, I gave a talk, my first talk in information theory, and then immediately after that there was uh, there was the dinner and. Uh, a big person was sitting next to me, and he was really kind and, and, and told me how he enjoyed the, the talk. But then immediately we started arguing about Middle Eastern politics. And, <laughs> and uh, then I found out that this is really, as, as, as was mentioned here, he is a, he's a, a Renaissance man. He knows a lot on everything, on history and geography, politics, and um, always uh, uh, innovating and um, always with a different angle. And it was really fun. I mean, no matter what subject was raised, he knew something about that, and it, one thing led to another. And uh, well, we, we were arguing a lot, as I said, mainly about politics. Um, actually, the, the next encounter that I really um, remember, uh, we become sort of uh, friendly or, or, or in touch. You, of course, was I, I looked up at him. So he invited me to Bielefeld. This was a. Uh, the fall of 93, actually invited alone at the same time. We, we mentioned Bielefeld, uh, but you must agree with me that Bielefeld is not the most fun place on, on earth, <laughs> especially the university there, which is just one big building. Uh, one good thing came out of it. I become good friend with Alon, who happened to be at the same time with me in Bielefeld. But again, um, Woody was generous, invited us, talked with us, um, make many tools with us, and caused us to eat this uh, lipische cake, uh, that of the, 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 the food, the, the traditional food in this region. Um, all the, um, try to find interesting places for us in Hamlin or uh, some uh, castles around there. There are a few places uh, nearby. But we also had some chance to discuss about uh, science. And again, what I remember is that I, when I came excited to him about one result that I thought about a iterative feedback thing, and of course he pointed to me to some paper he had in a conference uh, 20 years before that. Um, but I kept working on feedback, uh, ne nevertheless. Um, I was again in Bielefeld, my second time in Bielefeld actually, the only time, I was two times in Bielefeld when uh, his sixth year's birthday. And from there I remember uh, one thing when I congratulated him. Uh, what he said is, um, there is so much work, but so little time. And, um, well, it has been, I think, 12 years after his sixth birthday. Uh, it's certainly not enough time. I just met him in Dublin a few months ago. I mean, he was lively and funny as ever. But this was the last time I met him. And I will remember him fondly, again, as a scientist, but as really a broad person, Renaissance man. Thank you. So I met Rudy for the first time in a workshop in Lake Balaton in Hungary in the mid-70s. I didn't know who he was at the time, and uh, as those who know him, uh, expected uh, he had those handwritten foils that he kept fumbling over the projector and sometimes when he could get absorbed in the presentation he would even turn them sideways and for the audience it was really hard to follow and so I remember it was uh, I think Imre Chizar who was chairing the session and uh, Rudy had gotten really enthusiastic about that presentation and there were three view graphs, one on top of the other, and one was sideways, the other diagonal. It was getting impossible. And he, he said, 
Rudy, take this pointer, and pointers at that time were these long wooden sticks. Use that pointer and show on the screen. Rudy got distracted and took the pointer. Then we saw a twinkle in his eye. He turned to the audience and shook the pointer and said, yes, but for what purpose? <laughs> then, as uh, people said before, he would not go to the excursions. So in one of those famous Swedish USSR workshops in Grena, I think it was in 85, there was a half-day excursion in, in the middle of the, con of the uh, meeting. And I had in the afternoon session a presentation that I was a little anxious about, so I didn't go to the excursion. I usually go to these excursions. And the only other person around was Rudy. And I, I remember when I asked why did, you didn't go to that excursion, he said, why should I? This is a local optimum. <laughs> and finally, I also shared a ride with him from Mölde. It was the program committee meeting of the Ulm Information Theory Symposium it was in December, winter in the coast of Sweden. And the morning that I had to leave to go to Copenhagen to catch a flight, he was also leaving, driving to Germany. He offered a ride, and I experienced also the harrowing high-speed drive with him. I remember when he shook that pointer to the audience, I thought to myself, I like this guy. And I still do, and he was a staple. You know, you go to any of the information theory meetings, you expect to see certain people, and you see them all the time. Well, Rudy was one of them, so it will never be the same without him. Uh, so I, I didn't know Rudy, I don't think, as well as most of the other speakers here. I'll keep it brief. Uh, but I do, I do uh, uh, remember uh, Mayor mentioned Rudy talked a little politics. I do remember hearing about Rudy's political views and and uh, heard the story that he was political views were somewhere between uh, Glenn Beck and Attila the Hun. And I thought this okay, this is maybe a guy that I should learn to know a little bit. So. <laughs> I, I did enjoy, particularly in recent years, talking to Rudy at some of the conferences. And I'll, I'll mention just one story, which uh, Sergio also mentioned. He, he was really all information theory, and I think that's, that's the way we remember him, and that's the way he would want us to remember him. Uh, some of you remember the late, uh, most of you maybe remember the late Sergio Cervetto. And uh, you may remember that Sergio had a something he thought was a real breakthrough in the multi-terminal source coding problem that had uh, stumped a lot of people for a number of years, in, including Rudy. And Sergio gave a very energetic talk on this uh, result at an ITW in Uruguay in 2006. And Rudy was right there in the front row, of course, as many people have mentioned, he always was, listening very carefully, and uh, asked several questions. Uh, he was clearly interested in it. And I saw him after the session walking out and scratching his head and pulling his beard and, and all this. And I happened to get on an elevator with him going up or down to the room and, and said, so, so Rudy, what did you think of Sergio's talk? And he said, well, yeah, he's just, I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure about it. He said, this, this is a really tough problem. I'm not sure about it. I think he, there, there might be some, some flaw in it. But he said, this guy's got a brain. And I, and I, you know, I thought that, that was an interesting comment. He was impressed by the approach. Sergio's uh, approach had been quite different, I guess, from what other people had done. So I told Sergio Cervetto about this a day or two later. I said, you know, I was talking to Rudy and, about your result. And, and he said, oh, what did he say? And I said, well, he said he wasn't sure about some of the details, but he said, you really had a, he said he thought you really had a brain, and Sergio said this kind of chest puffed up, and it was like that the highest compliment you could be paid is to have Rudy Alsfay to say that you have a brain. So we will all miss him, and I thank you for the opportunity to say a few words. So 
So, so thanks to all the speakers for your nice contributions and stories. I hope you will keep him in good memory. And uh, well, I shall conclude with another anecdote. We heard that he's, he used to drive very fast three times in this uh, uh, among his stories. And uh, he was punished, of course. And uh, at one trip from, uh, back from a numerical con conference on numerical mathematics, he was stopped three times by the police. And he had to pay really a lot, 100 Deutschmarks. It wasn't my <laughs> Was it this trip? So it was uh, 100 Deutschmarks for the first at the first stop, 200 at the at the second stop, and 400 at the uh, third stop. So a geometric series, he told me. But his consequence was not that he stopped driving fast, but he told me he will never visit again a conference on numerical mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay then. We should conclude this session. I hope you will be able to catch the, the buses. Let me mention that there will be probably a conference, a memorial conference in Bielefeld the week before the is it. It's not definite yet, but probably on around 26th of July. So if you stop and or if you fly via Frankfurt or Amsterdam, Bielefeld is not too far. Okay, thank you very much.